There are a lot of things related to usability of your API, to the strategy of where it goes. So if we open this in here, it's not only about adding new fields on new endpoints. It's about the whole integration experience. And uh, it can be quite complicated. This was the moment when we decided to start an API console. The main challenge with uh, the early stage startups specifically is, is the speed of doing things. So startups move fast and your product is MVP and so are your docs. So in the context of docs, you need to focus specifically on short-term immediate value rather than thinking and strategizing about the ideal state of the docs. My warmest welcome to the API Dinox podcast with my two guests today, Alex Akimov and Helen Kosova. Very welcome. Hello, and thank you for having us here today. Hello. So and I said Alex's name first because I know Alex for many years now. And it is, uh, I think, thanks for uh, him that I have the well honor and privilege to have uh, Alan Kosova on the podcast, and you, she said that it's it's well, it's your first recording. Although probably everybody who's busy with API documentation knows you, because you are the mysterious, incredibly helpful Helen who answers people as questions, be that basic or highly advanced, at the uh, documenting APIs uh, channel at the Write the Doc Slack. So very, very welcome, and thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Thanks for having us. And yes, now you know who, who that is. For a bit more introductions, uh, both of you are currently working at Monite. Uh, Helen, uh, you're working as API technical writer and Alex as head of API platform at same company. And uh, Alex uh, used to work at Adia as head of API. Uh, you probably have met him as a speaker. Whereas Helen, if I understand well, you used to also work at SmartBear. Yes, before uh, joining Monite, I wrote various kind of docs for SmartBear, which is a maker of tools for software development, for testing and monitoring. And SmartBear also makes the Swagger tool set, including Swagger UI, Swagger Editor, and Swagger Hub. And that's that's basically how I got how I learned about the Open API specification, and uh, I got to write the Open API syntax guide that is published on the Swagger website. That's why I can answer people's questions. Mm -hmm. And now you're working together at Monite for for how long? Did you start at the same time? Uh, I joined Monite uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, this was shortly before uh, after I started. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, I started. Uh, I think. Almost two years ago, a little bit less, and uh, then basically we were growing as a company, and we were looking for talented people. You know, all this startup environment uh, where you have much more work to do, and you're looking for somebody who has uh, who is sharing the same passion and, and ideas with you about great API, great API documentation. And at that moment, we also had Paula joining us. Uh, it's all lead technical writer and uh, Helen also, we convinced her that it's, it's, it's the right place to be, to, to to build something great together. So you knew each other from before as a technical writers? Y yes, we knew each other before for quite some time because I, uh, I met Helen at one of the uh, internal conferences in one of my previous companies. And then I realized that she knows so much about Open API, and uh, quite often I was asking her about some questions because I believe um, that many organizations that they don't don't use Open API to the fullest, and this is the foundation of great API documentation, great API design, everything. It's of course not only because of that, Helen. Uh, you're the nicest person I've ever met, uh, but obviously we had a lot of common touch points and discussion points, and this of course helped us to form a new team and to work together now. Was it a culture shock Helen, to join uh, Monet? I mean, coming from SmartBear, uh, just like uh, Alex is coming from IDN, uh, there's a different uh, magnitude of communications, I guess. Yeah, so switching from enterprise environment to startup environment is uh, has been an exciting and fun journey because uh, of uh, 
So as you mentioned, the differences in the scope and the differences in the team dynamics, uh, it's like, I would say it's like apples and oranges. Some people uh, like prefer one, some people prefer other and some like both. So. Yeah, and um, very similar for me. Uh, basically, this is the topic I touched upon recently at the API the Docs conference here in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, many thanks for inviting me. And it was a great honor for me to be there. Uh, and uh, what I really want and I keep thinking about this and I want to share with uh, the community uh, the details because every time you switch a company organization, it's uh, it can be a big change, it can be a small change, it depends on many factors, on the company culture, on the goals, or on the technology and what you're doing. But obviously there are some common patterns. And when I was living at Adyen, I had the feeling that Adyen is a big successful organization. Some people can call it an enterprise, some people can say that it's smaller. And uh, when I was joining a startup uh, like Monite uh, with big aspirations, as every startup trying to disrupt the whole industry, building invoice automation, embedded finance, all these kind of things, I I, I I was thinking that I have a good idea what to expect, but after some time I realized that my expectations were like not all wrong, but mostly many of them were different. And obviously there are some things you can do in the same way how you did before, some things you should be uh, really avoiding. And, and, and this is very interesting learning, especially when it comes to API, API documentation and building API first companies like Monite. Just for clarity, uh, when was Monite founded? Was this a, a sort of a greenfield opportunity to work on the API platform and the APIs for both of you, or did you get to an already forming case? Monite was founded uh, three years ago, but uh, first it started as a B2B uh, software company. And uh, the company founders quickly realized that uh, they want to switch their business model and there is a much bigger opportunity in building uh, an API infrastructure for invoice automation and in general for finance document automation. Uh, and uh, this is when they pivoted the company and they started building the completely new team around them. And this was uh, roughly this time when I joined along with many of my other colleagues and then as we mentioned Helen joined us. So in that sense it's a definitely a greenfield opportunity because you have a lot of influence and this is also just in the interest of everyone how we build our API, how we create our API documentation, uh, how we structure our work, what's important, how we get uh, feedback from clients and so on and so on. So uh, everything you read in the articles about building API first organizations and everything, doing everything right, starting with API design, uh, obviously uh, this is something that you can easily apply in a new organization, but then you will also immediately see what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and how maybe this all can be combined together. Did you experience this similarly, Helen, that you from the get-go, you were invited to have a huge influence on even setting up the processes and, and where the initial vectors are pointing? Yes, exactly. So in startups, especially at early stages, you start with hiring highly skilled people who know exactly what they are doing, who, who can apply their prior experiences to set things up from scratch. And as such, you're also directly involved in making decisions about procedures, tools, uh, the best practices. So you basically are setting them up to uh, be used from now on. And do you find this comfortable with so much experience that you're basically stepping into organizational, like we can call it just setting up processes, but it cannot be separated from organizational culture. In it's the sort of the inverse Conway law that if you set up tool chains and processes, it will organize the communication patterns and ultimately the company culture. Laura, you asked a very good question. When you're coming to a new organization and you already know how things should work, right? And, and you see, and you try to do this and, and it's not like that. So coming to a startup with a lot of experience, I think this can be very challenging. Uh, like uh, also like it can be mentally exhausting because you expect things just to work. You expect people just to know. Uh, and it can be caused by several things. It can be caused just 
like because you will, you've been working in a previous environment and you expect things to be done in a certain way. So obviously, and I experienced this myself also, like not only in a startup, but before coming, like also coming to IDM, I expect things to work in a certain way. And uh, that's, uh, I think, just important to be self-aware and understand that, okay, we are building something and this something can be different. <laughs> and we listen to each other. We have a new mix of people now, new experiences, and probably it will not be the same. Probably it will not be super efficient as you might think in the beginning. Maybe it will be, and you will be able to learn from this. And this is the beauty of building something. Uh, so focusing on this, I think this gives you mental power uh, to finish the exercise well together with your team. And uh, on the uh, communications, I think, yeah, th 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 this is a perfect topic uh, on the Converse law. I, I, I saw, I don't know, maybe some people might disagree, but I saw it's uh, uh, affecting uh, our API and any other API so many times. So I think when you're working on the API design, this is maybe one of the things that is uh, affected most because if you have five teams working on different uh, parts of your product internally, quite often you go to the documentation and you see five different APIs. It might be a good decision, might be a bad decision. You don't know until you really start integrating with this API. But many times it means that this API like uh, really different in, in the form, in, in the naming, in the structures, in the version, and in, in, in a lot of different strategies because this is isolated if there is no good communication internally. And there are some pretty uh, straightforward and uh, well-proven things how we can resolve it. One of them, uh, I, I think I also mentioned this in my presentation at the API the docs is uh, API console. I strongly believe in that. I know some companies uh, who already do this and uh, also Adin is an example of that. And we immediately started doing this at Monite. Uh, Helen is a valuable member of API console and she can talk a lot about that. <laughs> but basically the idea of API console is to harmonize harmonize all the communication across different teams at that level. When you start doing something around APIs and if your API first, API design first, it happens early in the process, then already at this level, you harmonize more or less the decisions that you make. And this results in, in a good outcome in user experience and developer experience API documentation for clients. Helen would love to hear your opinion on that because yeah, we often have endless debates on API design, but I, I never probably discussed how, how you see this experience. I'm um, very happy to be on the council and to um, to have an impact on our API design. And Alex probably mentioned that we have representatives from different teams on the council. We have technical writers, we have QA people and uh, developers as well. And uh, it helps to have this perspective from different people. Uh, QA and text writers, for example, they are often the first users of a new feature and they can estimate if something is usable enough and propose changes that would make more sense or be more consistent or useful. The council, how is this started and how regulated are you in your decision-making processes, let's put it that way. And could you put that into context? Like how many people are we talking about and how? what is your cycle time on the console and how long-reaching decisions are you making? And who, who needed to be there? What roles? Oh, good question. I, I don't think there is a blueprint how any company can introduce a console. I can just tell about our experience. And uh, yeah, we can... Uh, uh, share this together with Helen. Basically, once we realized, and this was very early in the beginning uh, when we were discussing our API at here at Monite, together with our CTO and uh, uh, other uh, people who really care, I think everybody cares about API at Monite. And we were discussing uh, how to make things really good and usable uh, up to industry standards, but also how to build shared knowledge around that. And the first prerequisite uh, that uh, we saw is creating clear guidelines. Uh, again, there is nothing new in creating API guidelines. You can already take some guidelines that exist somewhere open source. There is a good, I think, API style guide from Zalando, from Adidas, from other companies as well. Uh, based on our experience, we saw that there are a lot of 
patterns uh, that we want to do differently or we want to just combine you know take the best best of all the worlds and that's why we created our uh, api guidelines but we decided also to automate it to, to do linting with spectrum and open api and also to open source so basically so more people can use it this was our strategy uh, but then besides guidelines, when we looked around, we understand that even if we apply that, it's still a lot of things that besides guidelines, because guidelines, they define only the basics. But uh, there are a lot of things uh, related to usability of your API, to the strategy, where it goes. So if we open this in here, it's not only about adding new fields on new endpoints, it's about the whole integration experience, and uh, it can be quite complicated. This was the moment when we decided to start uh, an API console. An API console in general is open to everyone in the company. I, of course, personally believe that the more people we have in the, in the discussion, the better. Uh, we can always reach consensus. It's not a problem. But of course, in a startup, everybody is wearing multiple hats. And because everybody is wearing multiple hats, everybody is busy with a lot of things. So I wouldn't expect a lot of people be there. Uh, so we agreed on the following format. In our console, we have representatives of every product or shared teams. Uh, as Helen mentioned, we have technical writer, we have a QA engineer, we have developers, we have uh, also somebody from the product side. And we have a cadence uh, of regular meetings. Basically, every week we have an hour blocked for our discussions. And these discussions are related to any API improvements that are happening, any, any API design changes, but also on setting up the guidelines. And of, of course, meeting just once a week is not is not efficient enough because we want to move fast. We also have an internal Slack channel where we have numerous API discussions in between these meetings, which helps us also to maybe make fast solutions, but maybe also to set up some context before we go into the meeting and make uh, some decisions. And the last but not least, very important component of the process is how we introduce the changes in our public API because we believe that. We are following API as a product concept, we API as company. We believe that every change in our public API is so important that it requires uh, additional consideration and uh, an explicit approval from API console. This means that every development team, every product team, uh, when they're working on a new functionality, which will result in changing the API design, they should bring this API design for our review. Uh, this can be done in a very formal way, so they can create a specification page in Confluence, they can write down all the use cases, they can make some proposals, pros and cons, and we can look into these problems, especially for big API designs, I think this is crucial. But it can be also quite informal, it can be just a small message to our Slack channel, or maybe we can have a small discussion in the API console meeting, and we decide all together, basically. And this allows us to help uh, uh, common shared ongoing process of making API design changes all together. And also this allows us to understand what's going on in other teams to keep the line and to make sure that what we produce is consistent, is good enough for our customers. Uh, usually API console members, uh, they spend from three to six months within the console and uh, it's good if uh, we rotate team members, if more people come because those who have been in our discussions, they already uh, gain a lot of experience how to make decisions right. And then they bring this experience back to the teams. So this is also a process how we share knowledge internally. This is uh, super helpful. Uh, but obviously uh, some members, uh, like uh, they can stay there forever. And Helen is a member of the council who was there from the beginning. Uh, so basically this is how it works. I can only add that uh, I've noticed that since the year, since the API Council was uh, has started, the new designs, the new proposal, the initial proposals, they already align more closely with our guidelines. So the guidelines in and the Council, they work in, uh, they have effect on spreading actual knowledge across the development team. And so they are indeed effective. Where do you normally step in, Helen? What is uh, what is the, the points that you make sure are adhered to in, in the council? I understood from um, previous conversation that Alex has his eyes more on strategy, as I guess you have to enforce that it stays a platform and behaves like a platform. And Helen, you talked about yourself that you more consider yourself in the tactical execution of things, basically. This is a 
yeah subjective distinction of what is subject what is what is strategic and what is tactics it depends uh in the eye of the beholder but what are the points that you usually um insist on as a member of the council uh as a technical writer i try to make sure that the naming makes sense the naming of uh, the endpoints parameters and new fields uh, i try to estimate how new endpoints fit into uh, the user flows and uh, just uh, and also pay attention to uh, meeting our general API design guideline in the terms of in terms of using the correct HTTP methods, uh, response status scopes, and things like that. And Alex, what is it that everybody knows that you will say that? I will also say that we cannot just make a breaking change. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So basically, one of the things that I really care about is that every decision that we make, we are not making it because it's more comfortable for us internally. Obviously, if it's more comfortable, it's also a good point because it allows us to move faster and to bring some valuable functionality to our product. But at the same time, I really try to understand how customers will be using it. And part of my job also at Monite is helping all our clients with our technical integrations. This means that uh, on the daily basis, I have numerous meetings with our clients, looking into the issues, trying to understand, trying to help, and also trying to see what can be improved in our API design. I think uh, it's super crucial, especially in the beginning of building your API platform. Maybe over several years, we already know more or less that it will be much more stable, but now we're in the moment where we're actively growing and we need to understand a lot of things and obviously there are so many things that we don't know about and even if you think it's perfect the other day you already see how it can be improved uh, to the next level uh, that's uh, something that I, I really try to focus on and uh, what Helen also did not mention but I think this is what all the members of the API consoles do a lot uh, we also look at the existing guidelines at the industry standards at what I don't know what are the best uh, security practices here, what open API standard enforces, and therefore it also means that it's a good practice for any, any good API design. So I, I think in general, API console is not only about uh, setting guidelines and doing the design itself, it's about spreading the knowledge, but also it's about setting up the API first culture, which is probably one of the most complicated things to do. So people think about API and people understand it's important. Uh, it sounds very easy, and it's easy maybe to say from the stage, hey, we should do this. We can have a company update. I can come there and say, hey, everybody, API is important. <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't work like that, because uh, to make sure it, it, we really build good API, you know, we need to build good culture. And good culture is um, compounded from all the small bits and pieces, small discussions, small considerations that, that, that you do on a daily basis. It's very ephemeral. APIs and culture both. Um, you were mentioning, Alex, when you started talking about the API Council, that you believe this is one of the things that is fruitful and maybe even crucial, uh, both in a smaller organization and in an enterprise-sized uh, organization. Now, I have two questions. One is immediately answerable. That's about the rotation that you mentioned. Do you think that in an enterprise, the rotation is also possible or there is just the communication doesn't happen fast enough or there's too much, I don't even know, real estate. From my previous experience, I would say it's definitely possible. And my personal opinion, it's even more important because with more people in the organization, it's even more important to have API ambassadors, API champions, API knowledge experts in every team. And this means that they can be regular members of your console, but they can be also, you know, console fellows or somebody who comes from time to time or who uh, raises a valid question, something that can be added to guidelines or some issues that you hear and I see here and there. And uh, once also you grow as an organization, once you have much more customers using your product, I think it's really important to hear the voice of your clients and of people who are dealing with this uh, customer request. So in a big organization, it's important that you hear the voice of uh, technical writers, of technical support, of people who are dealing with uh, customer integrations, maybe going to the field and doing the integration there. And 
probably they can join a council probably they, they're so busy that, that, that they're not regular members but it, it's important that, that you also include those people and also rotate as much as possible one of the speakers on the api the docs conference that you referred to which happened in amsterdam in person in june 2023 uh one of the speakers and i apologize i don't remember who but somebody else was referring to the api council with two pictures. One is how you imagine it. And that was a scene out of Star Wars with the elders sitting in complete agreement and serenely making choices. And he said, sometimes reality can turn into more like a scene out of Game of Thrones. <laughs> and, um, some people in the audience were laughing in a very, um, yeah, fashion. So I guess also this is um, easier said than done. Now, what are the, what are the other aspects uh, that you see are intuitive or counterintuitive differences uh, between how do you realize an API first momentum in an enterprise or in an SME? What other dimensions did you name uh, and, and where, where do you see more um, differences uh, rather than the similarity of the council with which you would both recommend for any size company? Yeah, I... This picture was in my presentation because uh, this is exactly I no no worries but this is exactly how I didn't remember the picture. <laughs> this was a good picture when I found it. I was like, okay, exactly. I mean, not always we always like friendly and welcoming people, but sometimes we come to this console. Everybody is busy with their thoughts and workload, and now we have some API and we look at each other like very scared. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> how can we make, even make a decision because it's it's it all looks strange and unfamiliar. But at the end, uh, all, all the discussion actually everybody is usually aligned and we have a very clear picture which is a very uh, aha moment for for all of us and i always appreciate when this aha moment happens i think obviously uh, there are differences uh, and it can be related to the size of the organization to the maturity of the organization but maybe also to the experience that people have and here in at monite everybody joined like recently and if you joined more than six uh, months ago you're already uh, like one of the oldest people people in the company uh but but still you joined very recently uh what it means it means that we are still building something and we are learning from that uh this means that we are open uh, to experiment we're open also to explore new ideas at the same time we don't have a lot of experience uh because we don't have prior experience of customer requests or struggling with something uh and something and what we are building is unique and you we cannot look at the competitor and and align more or less our designs with what our competition is doing which would be unfair in the first place but also this is the reality and this is the beauty of where we are and i believe if you're in a big organization of course you need to take into account numerous things first of all how it was already done in the past then how these decisions were made and who made these decisions ideally uh, it's always important to understand and find any documentation like internal also documentation on these uh, decisions if there was an architecture decision record or like something like that all the very issues because you can easily come up with a new design and then it can happen that this new design was something that the company already tried in the past and it didn't work for some reason so it's important to have uh, this context for anybody who is participating in the conflict but it's important also to understand that if somebody uh, has a disagreement with you uh, maybe there is a reason and maybe there is some like history of some technical decisions or maybe some problems with different clients uh, and, and that's uh, something we need to overcome uh, what I'm talking here, I also referred to this in, in my presentation. Uh, I think also it's part of the legacy that the company has. And I compared the legacy with the snowball because uh, in the beginning the snowball is, is very small, but once you start rolling it, it picks up more and more snow. And then it becomes really big. Probably you can be proud of your big snowball, but it's so heavy and it's so difficult and not so enjoyable. And you cannot add more stuff. So basically, um legacy affects a lot of decisions and an enterprise organization uh you really need to make sure you spend a lot of time on doing api archaeology on finding all the maybe zombie apis that you have on understanding how you can duplicate some things how we can get rid of all the api versions and in a startup it's very easy because you're doing this just now you don't have a lot of legacy uh and my general recommendation would be to avoid these difficulties to always think about uh, 
the opportunities to reduce this legacy, how you can make sure you still have the snowball that is small enough so you can roll it yourself or with a small team of people. This will help you improve, this will help you enjoy what you do, and this will help you build great APIs. Did you see this in action in enterprise companies where you worked to keep that snowball still agile? I don't have experience working in uh, dozens of <laughs> enterprise companies. I have experience, my personal experience from uh, my previous organization, but also from uh, my colleagues I, I, I was talking about and I, I, about this. And I, I think many companies, they strive to do this, but it's really a difficult decision, uh, especially in, in tough times when companies struggle with a financial situation because quite often organizations, they focus on achieving business needs and they don't so much focus on uh, tackling the tech debt. And tech debt is something that um, is really slowing down many organizations. Uh, in my experience, uh, smart technical companies and uh, uh, my previous organization, Adyana, is one of them. They always include a part of your effort on, on tackling that. But, uh, once you grow to a large scale, it can be just something that you plan in advance and then spend two years of your time uh, uh, fixing that and uh, changing old customer integration and improving your page and just to make sure you can move fast. So basically, this is a trade-off that many organizations have. And if you think that in a startup, we don't have any legacy, at least this was my impression. <laughs> now I must say we already have some legacy that we also want to tackle. It's just the size that is different, but yeah, important that you have the real uh, power and also that you include it in your plans uh, to make sure that you don't have too much legacy and you can still move fast because moving fast is really enjoyable. Let me ask a very open question. Um, what are the, in your current experience and your current work context, what are the counterintuitive aha moments that you have arrived recently. And I'm going to ask Helen first because there's maybe like there shouldn't be anything counterintuitive. My ducks are walking in a row. But still, is there a duck that just wants to walk in a different row here? Is something something turning more towards chaos and you have a hard time bringing it back to, to a more orderly fashion? Is something spiraling out even maybe because of I don't know, the proliferation of standards, whatever. Yeah, uh, I think the main challenge with uh, the early stage startups specifically is, uh, is the speed of doing things. So startups move fast and uh, your product is MVP and so are your dogs. So in the context of dogs, you need to focus specifically on uh, short-term immediate value rather than thinking about thinking and strategizing about the ideal state of the dogs. And this can be a little tricky for perfectionists. And I'm a perfectionist myself, so um, I tend to think about this uh, the startup work as uh, a fun challenge of uh, just trying to do things differently than you are used to. I think it's a very important point, and I totally subscribe to that. Uh, it's more important that we help our customers right now uh, rather than be waiting for something which is really ideal. And this is also part of our startup strategy. We are in a product market feed mode. We're evolving and we are listening to our clients. And it's important also that we really listen to what they say because Quite often, and this was my aha moment also many times, quite often I have an ideal picture in mind how things should be, how they should be in our documentation, in our API, in our processes. And also when I'm like talking to a customer, for example, I think I already know what they want. And I'm explaining this because also they expect this knowledge from me as well. But Quite often, I realize that once I start assuming too much, I start thinking, okay, maybe the, the moon is this, and maybe this, and maybe this is a priority. If I really start asking them, if we really go into the details, quite often I realize that their picture is pretty different. <laughs> Actually, there are some other things that are important for them. And now it's my job to understand how we can help them quickly. Ideally, of course, we need to achieve uh, 
80 percent or he's doing 20 percent of effort <laughs> this is the way how you, you can move in any organization but um just uh, nurturing the skill listening to people's needs and also being bold enough to share something which is probably not perfect in your eyes but might be still perfect uh, when other people look at this so doing this i, I think it's an eye-opening moment for anybody here at monite and if I may add something about the MVP approach to DOCS, at one of the previous API the DOCS conferences, Mike Chang uh, did a talk about the MVP approach to DOCS, and I suggest everyone to check it out because it has some great info about what you should uh, focus on and start on when you uh, start documenting your APIs. And maybe last but not least, it can be very surprising uh, when you're stuck with something and you think you're alone here, basically, you need to solve it and you're already committed to that. But then all of a sudden you see a lot of people around you who are also interested in that, who are also helping you. So uh, I think uh, it's a beauty of working in a small organization that everything is um, transparent, everybody knows, and there are a lot of people who actually also want to contribute. So having great people in your team I, I think also this is of course an enjoyable experience but also quite often in our careers we tend to forget about that uh, and uh, it's important to all, always be open and to share with others and to see if somebody else also is actually uh, thinking about the same and can help you right now and you experience that as counterintuitive because of communication burden or oh um I wouldn't say it's like totally counterintuitive, but it's something that um, you might not always expect because you know that everybody is busy, right? And also, I experienced this many times when somebody is approaching maybe to me or maybe to others, they will say, yeah, we know you're busy, but do you have something? And I might be busy, might be not, but it's not about being busy. It's about building something together. And if I have something, that can be helpful, I share this. If not, then it's okay. And I think that many people operate in this mode. It's just something that we don't realize a lot. Helen, when you said that you're a perfectionist, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Renee Brown introduced herself on TED stage as I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> and for me, that was, oh, oh, I know that. <laughs> but perfectionism is both the biggest weakness and biggest strength. How do you how do you experience this in your daily work? It's just about in, about getting to understanding where you need to stop and ship things, understanding when um, making decision about when things are good enough, and uh, postponing any possible imaginable improvements for some time later, and that's how I deal with my perfectionists in uh, the startup context. I think it's working well so far. Is it the same for juniors who are just learning how to work as an API documentarian? For juniors, I think the most important thing is uh, getting enough mentoring from your colleagues uh, and uh, getting reviews. Do you mentor someone right now? Apart from the hundreds and thousands on the right of the external. Uh, no, we don't, but uh, we might. We are hoping to grow the docs team. Actually, there can be no, there never can be enough technical writers. Uh, so it's possible in the future. I personally feel uh, also very junior and foolish many times as well. So I, I think it's it's about having uh, some self-awareness about what you're doing and um, here we are doing a lot of things that for example i've never done myself in the past and this helps you also be motivated but also uh, to learn something from others and to understand that you have some strengths but also you have a lot of things to learn and this is the same for almost everybody at any, any, any moment of your career and yeah my, my, my advice to anybody who is just starting the career. Uh, also to realize that everybody was in that position just some time ago <laughs> and there is nothing bad about that. Uh, it's actually a very nice situation to be in because you still have so much interesting things to learn and just to proceed and, and learn that. 
I have a surprise question to both of you. This came with a lot of laughter uh, when I asked it from the jurors at the Deaf Portal Awards. Do you see a trend or hype in API documentation, or we can widen in a circle, that you really wish we just stopped with? Like, this has got to stop. This train has, has been moving too fast now, and, and everyone's on the train, but mm, you think this is not the right direction. Are you talking about AI now? Anything that you think that that has just, you know, storming the teacup has gathered so much momentum that it's becoming uh, an almost accepted practice, whereas it actually started as a fluke and we shouldn't be doing it. It's it's an interesting question because uh, obviously there are a lot of trendy things in technical documentation. Uh, in, in general, there have been a lot of trendy things in the technical documentation in the industry. In the last decade, like for example, a lot of um, people excited about Docs code, and I think this is the right thing to do, but it's very difficult to get it right. Uh, and it's still trendy, but um, uh, it's not more maybe uh, the goal. It's it's more the tool, and sometimes it works for you, sometimes it doesn't work. That's how you should look at it rather than uh, trying to solve all the problems with it. Although I am a big proponent of Docs Code myself, but what I mentioned about AI, I, I think in general, like AI has been a big uh, momentum right now. And when people say AI now, they mean usually you know ChatGPT or all these LLMs and the ability to generate uh, text and uh, images and whatever content you want to produce. And as an outcome of that, also people start thinking, okay, do we even need the API documentation? Do we even need uh, something that will help our APIs integrate with each other? Maybe we don't even need a good API design. Maybe our APIs will be smart enough. There will be some AI that just combine both of them if they have a good open API file. And I am afraid of this world, but I also understand that technically it's not possible right now. It might be possible in the future. If it will be possible, Probably it will make me happy, uh, although I will lose my job as well. Uh, but but uh, this is the kind of discussions uh, that I think it's healthy to have. Uh, but at the same time, uh, sometimes they result in something tangible, and sometimes they will never result in that. For a closure, um, I would like to thank both of you, Helen and Alex, for being our guests here and for sharing your insights and experiences in companies large and small. Thanks for having us. Thank you for inviting us. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.